get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fog Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of Atari, Zapier, P90X, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25's mission is, what our superpower is really, Ross, is we help people connect their best referral partners and customers two businesses. And so we do it in three ways. We do a done for you media piece. Um, basically we run a company's podcast. We have them launch their podcast. We run it. We distribute it across 11 different channels, you know, dedicated blog post goes with each episode, social media. So the person can simply show up and talk and we do everything else. Um, our team has been working with podcasters since 2009. I personally credit podcasting as the single best thing I've done for my business and my life. It's allowed me to connect with amazing people like you, and other founders and making best friends, finding my business partner, just countless relationships. So I think if you have, if you don't have one, everyone should have one for sure. Um, we also have a done for you lead generation service where we manually reach out. It's not paid manually reach out to send consistent flow of customized outreach messages to your ideal clients and referral sources. We also do done for you VIP events, um, VIP events with larger conferences, We partner with software companies or larger conferences and help them bring their highest level people in the room to connect and collaborate. We've even shown up in Elvis costumes. Uh, I don't know if we'll do that one again, but (laughs) I know Ross and his team, I basically see them everywhere at all the conferences. They obviously see the value of going and getting face to face, you know, Um, and it does require a lot of humans to do what we do. So we only look for and work with the right company. If you have questions or you're interested, go to support at rise25.com and email us. I'm especially excited, Ross, today. I've been doing a lot of research. I've seen you guys everywhere. You are everywhere. Um, today we have Ross Andrew Paquette, fo- uh, founder of Merrill Post. And he founded Merrill Post in 2011. So I want to hear what the landscape looked like in 2011 um, as an email service provider. But It quickly grew beyond the original vision and they help simplify customer engagement for companies across the board with their technology. So we'll talk about how the, you know, kind of the evolution of the product because it used to be email and now they basically handle it. We'll talk about single customer view because really that's what they allow companies to do. And they became one of the fastest growing companies in North America without ever raising funding. So we'll talk about Ross's um, opinion on bootstrapping versus raising money. And Merrill Post is trusted by companies like the Golden State Warriors, Mercedes Benz, Livestrong, the New York Post, and even smaller teams growing uh, like ZipBuds. And they are also working to make philanthropy more efficient. So they're going to use their superpower technology for the good, uh, greater good of the earth, really. And they use their technology to power nonprofits. And Merrill Post cares is a nonprofit focused on giving endangered species a second chance, uh, restoring ecosystems through conservation initiatives that they have. So Ross, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. I wanna go back to 2011 or even pre a little bit before 2011. What was the idea, original idea behind Maripo? Yeah. Yeah, so the original idea was actually to build more of a lifestyle business at the time. Mm. Uh, I come from a background in sales. I was working for a, a similar company selling, you know, email marketing automation um, and really saw a gap in the market in terms of the support side of things. That was really kind of the, the starting point to it all where, you know, I could probably have 10 clients uh, sit by the pool all day and, and support them and, and really just kind of carry on from that perspective. And of course, that uh, quickly grew. We, we kept developing our platform. You know, we kept selling, of course, our, our service. Uh, and over time, we, we just grew by by referral for the most part. So we had a, a really explosive, you know, few years. Um, we went from, you know, kind of zero to about 20 million in revenue with a, a very small team. Wow. Um, and it's been exciting, uh, needless to say. It's been very exciting. So were you growing up um, your typical entrepreneur? Not at all. No, I'm actually from a really small town in northern Ontario. 
uh, in Canada, no less. But um, not a lot of, you know, entrepreneurs coming out of there, certainly not a, a lot of tech entrepreneurs coming out of there. Uh, so really, that, that was never one of my goals. It your just kind of happened. Weren't, your parents yeah. weren't entrepreneurs? No, my, my father's a dentist, so somewhat entrepreneurial. So but, is mine. But not entirely. Yeah, no way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's hilarious. Um, I think, is it, wait, is Mark Zuckerberg's dad a dentist too? I'm not sure. I don't know. That's a great question. Maybe it's yeah. like this this thing. I don't know. But yeah. yeah, I mean, he had his own business though, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was absolutely. Yeah. yeah. With dentistry, very much are running a business. But, you know, I wouldn't say with the same, you know, kind of issues that may come up with, a, you know, a technology suite and, and having to function across, you know, kind of North America or the even the European landscape. Yeah, I remember a lot of lessons around the table of someone who has their own business. Are there any stick out from your dad that he uh, I certainly got sorry yeah any stick out from your dad of what he's kind of instilled in you or yeah to you about? certainly the work ethic side of things I mean um, you know he was the at work by 8 a.m. home by 8 p.m. type of individual so in the, the earlier stage he was very much you know focused on that side or sorry he still is to this day he's 73 now and still does the same thing day in and day out I mean a little bit more travel thankfully but um, yeah, still the same. So, so I mentioned that work ethic side of things. Yeah. Um, so it went from email. What was the next kind of iteration? Yeah. So the, the one of the core, you know, kind of um, aspects that I've always been super excited about was the automation side of things. And when I say automation, I mean more of that that drag and drop atmosphere. I mean, in in 2011, there there weren't you know there were very few companies who had anything in in that you know kind of arena where you could drag in different nodes and, and build a, you know, a process flow around it. Um, so w that was one of the key elements that I re really wanted to get into quickly. And, and that certainly happened. And then over time, you know, of course, things like social come up and then mobile comes up and then customer acquisition and then surveys. Um, so, you know, given all of that, you know, those areas are, are really tied together. You know, that was that was sort of the evolution of the, the first, you know, kind of the first product or the first suite that we developed, which was more around Again, the marketing or digital marketing side of things. I was shocked, by the way, Ross, when I learned through my research how you found your CTO. Yeah, <laughs> so that's an, always an interesting one. I mean, that that go, will will certainly go down as one of the, you know, either luckiest <laughs> or greatest moments in my life. Um, they I should, was actually so the, you go ahead, yeah. go ahead. Well, I was going to say the company already existed. So, so Mariposte was already, you know, heading on and, and I was working with another individual and, and that just didn't, you know, wasn't working out. Um, you know, and then I, I was actually working at another company at the same time. So I had a full, you know, full-time job. And, you know, while we were running through those issues, I was like, you know what, maybe I'll just close things down here. This didn't work out and I'll go back to work. And, and that is what it is. Uh, and then it was actually, coincidentally, you were talking about my parents. It was, you know, it was them who said, hey, why don't you, you know, look online. And our product um, in the early stages was built mainly in Ruby on Rails or, or in Ruby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking there's nobody in North America that's really focused on that. It wasn't, you know, popular at the time. I, you know, to say it even really ever got super popular over here is, is another conversation altogether. Um, so I went on to Odesk, which is now Upwork, and he was the first person I talked to. And I was just putting it, you know, hey, does anybody know how to develop in, in Ruby that, you know, can help with a, an email marketing platform? And within two weeks, we, you know, you turn things around in terms of the, the technology mm. side of things. And, you know, the rest is kind of history there. But he's actually now lives in, in Canada as well. So he moved there mm. and he, he spends time back in, in India and in, in Canada as well. Upwork should like feature, yeah. they're public now, right? They really should. Actually. Upwork yeah, should, you should reach out on, they need to feature you as a success yeah. story. Like yeah. look at the company we built from yeah. your platform. I said in the introduction Absolutely. of the platform. Yeah, we have to reach Absolutely. out today. Get them on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. At what point did you? And I know we'll we'll talk about kind of the bootstrapping conversation versus raising money. At what point did you decide to quit your job? And was that a big decision for you? Um, it wasn't because because the company, you know, again we had a couple customers, and then you know, and they were they they knew what I was trying to do, and they got on board early on, and so they were kind of in a way funding it. They were using it, of course, yeah. in the early stages. Um, but it, it was really just a natural progression. We, you know, we hit a, a you know, kind of revenue uh, benchmark and it was like, you know, Ross can now spend 24 hours a day on this. And it didn't, it wasn't really, you know, there wasn't a decision that went into it. Certainly there was no, should I keep doing this? Should I, or should I stay or should I go in a way? Um, it was very much just, hey, we hit this point. 
you know, this makes sense now. Let's just keep moving. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't a ton of, you know, it wasn't a, a strenuous decision around, you know, around what I should do. Cause I coming from a sales background, right. There's, there's plenty of opportunity out there for great people in there. And I, I'd been very successful and fortunate to be very successful on that, that front. Um, so it was quite simple. So, I'm going to bounce around to the product to the team because I'm, I know you're sure. you're really into team building and culture. Um, talk about the evolution of the team. So it's you, and then you yeah. have a technical. What? Tell me what, how it grew from a team perspective. Yeah. So that's that's a great question as well. So one thing you know of the very few things that I would go back and do differently is it was it was uh, this you know it was a handful of us for a very long time. Uh, much longer than I think most, you know, companies would ever get by on is certainly from the customer count perspective or the revenue perspective. Um, so it was, it was around 2016, you know, so five, four or five years later when we first started, you know, bringing on more people. And I don't mean a lot more people. I just mean yeah. more than, you know, five to 10 kind of thing. Yeah. What did that core um, look like before that? Yeah. It was really just him and I, and, and maybe a, you know, a couple of others, but wow. nobody from a real like, kind of senior leadership, you know, perspective, you know, we, we really only started to focus on that about, you know, 24 months ago now, maybe, maybe a little bit longer. Um, it's so pretty remarkable, you know, Ross. Yeah, it was it was it was really unique. Were you just uh, wearing a lot of hats in those days? Uh, for sure. Yeah, I was I was the sales rep, the customer service rep, the, the finance individual, the yeah, the HR individual. There was definitely a lot of hats. So, uh, but that was a you know that was definitely an exciting time for its own reasons. I, I, I wouldn't have done that part any differently. Um, but you know, once you start to bring in individuals who can really you know take control of of individual you know departments or or start to cross departments and of course working together. You know the economies of scale just really shoot through the roof and you know well i wouldn't go back necessarily and do anything differently if we had done that earlier on I, I can only imagine where we would be today uh you know beyond where we are but uh, of course that's our path and we'll you know we continue to to advance it to today outside of that original group that you saw the exponential growth what was a key hire what were you thinking about hiring after that core group yeah so I'd say the you know the, there's a the number of hires. I mean, of course, you know we now have a SVP of sales, SVP of marketing. We have a VP of HR. We have a a uh, I have a, a COO a slash CFO, same same individual. I'd say it, it would be that last role in particular because of of you know sort of my style, not necessarily from a management perspective, but just what it took to you know get the business to where it was during that time you can't really take a step back because it's just all go no stop bringing customers you know yeah. make them successful and you can't even take a step back to say oh you know where what does the team look like is everyone happy you know how are they performing there's really not leave a, a wake of like bodies yes. behind you yeah there's a lot of that yeah yeah so so when you know when that individual came on board you know he really had the ability to to do you know to handle that aspect and, and really focus on, okay, how do we start to clean up this, this sort of wake that you're referring to um, and make sure that, you know, there, that doesn't exist anymore. Make sure we can start to channel, uh, you know, that vigor that I have in, in the right way and right areas and, and, you know, with the right people uh, backing you. Um, so that was, that was a unique kind of shift because, you know, again, there, there's the conversation, it doesn't matter what revenue is, but whether it's, you know, zero to 20 or zero to 30 and then 30 to a hundred, you know, there's different, you know, personality traits that are required for each of those levels. And, you know, there's a lot of whether they're CEOs, founders, you know, entrepreneurs, once they get to a certain point, it's like it's hard to step back and say, OK, now we need I need I need to shift my my, my view and do things differently. Um, and the faster you can do that, you know, the better off you're going to be, the better off your team is going to be. And of course, you know, you start to go down the, the field, which, uh, you know, relates to your customers as well. So so really important you know, aspect, at least how I see it. Ross, what has worked, like, as you, you know, your team grows and you try and keep a really good culture and do team building, what's worked for the team building culture and what have you felt mm -hmm. has not worked as well? Yeah, I mean, again, just focusing on the team itself is the one thing that does work. And so when I say focusing is in giving them the room to make decisions, good or bad, hopefully they're all good, best case scenario. Um, you know, being able to work together, you know, being more, when I say more collaborative, I just mean in a positive manner, of course. You can always, you know, again, I think 
what, what happens with a lot of founders, entrepreneurs is they're used to doing everything on their own or doing many things on their own, wearing mm -hmm. a lot of those hats. And, you know, so when you bring somebody in to say a, a finance role, you have to trust that they're not going to do everything exactly the way you expected them to. And I think that's where you see a lot of turnover in those early stages is where, you know, somebody or the, the, the founder, entrepreneur, executive, whatever you want to call them, hasn't again, you know, become open minded to, hey, we're going to maybe we're going to lose some revenue. Maybe we're going to lose some customers. Maybe we're going to make a couple bad choices here. Maybe our reporting is going to be out. You know, there could be any number of things taking that step back and saying, but I'm okay with it. You know, I mean, you're never really okay with it, but you got to take the step back and say, I'm okay yeah. with it. Uh, otherwise you'll just never make that leap to sort of the next stage. Are there certain hiring practices that you've discovered that you'd recommend? Cause it kind of goes yeah. back to, you know, if you give them room, it's because you probably hired the right person. I imagine. Yeah. I, well, yeah, yes and no. But, um, on the hiring practices side, so that's a unique, uh, always a unique conversation for me. I am the worst person when it comes to hiring. Why do you Because I that? take every, I take everybody at face value, right? If somebody shows up and they're like, "Yes, I can make your dreams come true," I'm just sitting there going, "Yay, this is amazing." He's gonna make, he or she is gonna make my dreams come true. They sound great, and then six weeks later, I'm like, "So what happened to all the dreams coming true?" And you know, things aren't panning out as good. And so you really have to, you know, and I, and I, you know passionately agree with this it has to be a you know relatively as much as you can be a team approach is in having multiple people from whatever avenues you can whether it's people from your board whether it's you know people uh you know from an advisory perspective of course people from the, the team if, if you do have a team um you know getting all of those you know views and and positions so that you can better make that decision um you know trying to just you know again in my case going at face value is one thing but you know, trying to make that decision is, is, you know, it's significant because one wrong hire and you're a year behind, you yeah. know, two wrong hires and hopefully you're not two years behind, but they just start to compound on each other. And, and that's, you know, I think when, when, again, when you start, when as a, as a founder or entrepreneur, once you get the organization to a certain point, you know, going backwards is not an option. And that is probably the fastest way to go backwards. So um, you've changed the, the hiring process to incorporate more individuals throughout the steps yeah. or? Yeah. And I realize that may sound like common sense, but um, a lot of the people I talk to and again, kind of the, the SMB mid market as they're going into it, they, they really don't do that. They just, they go on their own instinct, their own gut. And of course, you know, some people are probably more successful or have been more successful at it than I, and some people have been less, but you know, the more you can put a, pro a really strong process around it, you know, the more it's um, going to be valuable. And I do think as well that, it, you know, this was a really tough one for me, but sometimes investing in a recruiting firm, obviously you want to have a strong recruiting firm, um, you know, can, can pay for itself overnight, you know, just with, just with the right people. Uh, you know, of course, nobody wants to get a bill for 50, you know, 80, hundred thousand dollars for one hire. You know, when you hear that and you're in the, you know, one, two, even five million stage, you're like, but we could hire a whole person for a whole year for that amount. It's a big jump to move, because again, if you're a founder entrepreneur and you're bootstrapped, that's literally your money. Uh, so how do you make that decision? Difficult. Whether you to you do you, take the lead. I mean, you personally, they, do you decide to hire someone specifically for that at that point, or do you hire a? Well, I, a, I, I took the harder road. So okay. I, my the harder road was no. I think we could do it on our own, and yeah. you know, again, and then we get to a point where you just say, like, okay, we got to try something different, and this is different. So let's try it, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Yeah. And if it does great but um you know again, so you did both that up essentially for, yeah i did the wrong way and then i did the right the right way for us yeah um bootstrapping versus raising money your philosophy uh, on that yeah so that's a that's a again yet another passionate topic of mine you know i would love to see more companies especially in the tech space it, you know bootstrap it, it's becoming you know more rare you know as the days go by there's not, you know, there's just not enough of it. It's too easy to raise $50 million. I just got a, an email literally two hours ago about a competitor of ours raising $50 million right after they raised $60 million like last year. I'm like, wow. where, where are you spending all that money? Like, are you swimming around in it? I, I assume you'd have to be at that point. Um, so, you know, for me, again, coming from that background, I, I would love to see more companies like that. I'd love to see, you know, more founders, entrepreneurs. I, I'm not a big fan of the you know, jump in, raise $5 million, grow by all costs, then, then 10, then 20, then 50, then a hundred. I mean, there's too many stories out there like that. And 
you know, I, I don't I don't think it fosters the right environment. Right? There's there's obviously a lot of content out there around, you know, San Francisco and group thing. I mean, I kind of I see this as one of those pieces. You know, somebody thinks like, hey, I'm going to start a tech company and, you know, it's either all or nothing. Like, I don't like that idea of all or nothing. Like, why can't we do something or why can't people do something in the middle? Just build a great company, build a great organization. It doesn't have to be a home run or nothing. Um, yeah. So I personally would like to see that. I think, I think you know, if you focus more on building an organization, right, and I say an organization and something that is, maybe it's not going to be timeless, but but maybe it could be timeless, as in, Maybe this product is something that's going to be needed, you know, for for as long as is possible. Maybe it's something that's going to be, you know, industry defining in a way where you can keep, um, excuse me, you can keep building it without the goal of, well, if we don't sell to Oracle or to SAP or to Salesforce, you know, we're failures. I, you know, I think I think there's a lot of that out there. Um, because I, I always wonder, I'm like, every, well, there's so many of these companies or so many companies being started where are they all going? You know, Salesforce is not going to buy 15 marketing automation platforms right. or, or 20 or 30 service and support platforms. I mean, what is your end goal at the end yeah. of the day? You'd think uh, some of them, they're, you know, kind of positioning themselves as the end goal to sell to one of those, to Salesforce. Or most like of them that. are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most, most, you know, and I'm, again, I'm speaking to the tech space, but most companies, their goal is to, uh, in the tech space, are, are focused from that perspective. Yeah. So what's yeah. been, um, you guys grew exponentially with a small team. What were some of those inflection points? Some of the, and you're a sales salesperson at heart, I think from early yeah. on, um, what's helped fuel that growth? Cause many, 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 most companies do not experience that, that crazy yeah. amount of growth. Um, I mean, there's two things, obviously just being persistent in terms of, from a sales perspective, we had a lot of benefits in the early stages from a, from a customer referral perspective. So we, we've gotten a lot of our customers from our current customers and that philosophy still rings true. I mean, I, I, I believe that, you know, we're building stronger relationships with our customers that, you know, compared to most other solutions, because I think, you know, that it, it goes to the top in a way. Um, you know, I, I would guess that 80% of our customers I know personally, right. And of course, when you have 5,000 or 10,000 or more customers that you really can't do that depending on your market, but because we're looking for again that that mid market, you know, uh, uh, both in spend and in, in size, you know, you can get to know them. Whether it's uh, an email here or there, whether it's a phone call, whether it's a you know an on site visit, those things aren't that difficult these days. I mean, you can accomplish a lot just as we are doing today on video. I mean, that alone is a huge leap from just an email, you know, sending an email or or a text message or or even just talking on the phone. I mean. You can feel at least the emotion from the customer as to you know what they're experiencing. If it's an issue-based system, if it's a positive, then of course you want to you know experience that as well. So it's it's a you know it, it was always you know very much focused from that perspective. What was one of the early customers you were especially proud of that you finally got in touch with and they started using your platform? That's a good question. Um, hmm, there's a, there's a lot of them. Um, you know, Mercedes Benz would be up there for sure, just from a, a brand perspective. I mean, you know, it, that's that's no different than having, you know, a, a United or maybe not United, you know, an American Airlines or a United or something like that. You know, the cars and airlines, I don't know if you ever watched Mad Men, but, you know, getting your first car company, getting your first, you know, like those are huge milestones. You know, sports teams are the same, Golden State Warriors. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a fair amount of those, right? Like we, we've, and that's actually a great, you know, question because, I don't think anybody ever asked that. When I think of the most important verticals that we function in, we have a top organ, like a leading organization yeah. in all of them, right? Uh, we don't have an airline, I will say, but um, you know, we have a car company, we have a sports team, we have you know uh, leaders in the digital marketing space, we have leaders in the e-commerce space. Um, you know, that is really an exciting kind of piece to start to look at. Hey, what are our core, you know, verticals, and and who is our top customer in there, and then know that you're top customer is literally a top customer to anyone so which story yeah. sticks out as a salesperson that you know there's an interesting story behind actually getting that client on your platform yeah that's a good that's another good question so like maybe i don't know you're like oh yeah, yeah was that you know maybe it took like 3 years for the golden state warriors to finally 
you know, yeah. or whatever it is, We've, just something interesting is the persistent, you mentioned persistence earlier and I imagine, yeah. you know, you don't call the, them up and they're like, yeah, let's try out mail yeah. posts. That never happens. Yeah. But just that walk me through one of those journeys so people really kind of feel what it takes yeah. to, to, to get someone integrated and, and, and yeah. informed about your platform. A, a lot of it is, I mean, the one thing is that it, there was never, there, there isn't really a story where it required, you know, some long-term excessive you know not excessive but but intensive strategy yeah. to get a customer or mm-hmm. you know ross is showing up in the in the garbage bin outside the office or popping out <laughs> of the bushes or something like that it's like hey you Steph really curry have... like right yeah, off the yeah, press yeah. conference hey, are you interested in marketing automation <laughs> um yeah no that we don't really have anything like that but i mean there's you know i think what was what was really exciting was as soon as we show our platform or have showed our platform to some of these organizations they immediately get it you know there, there's not there's no confusion it's not really a like of course we're selling but it's not a sales pitch it's it's more of a show and tell we're showing our platform we're saying hey listen we 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 spent a lot of time focusing on the product and on the support side of things you know we're not so great at sales and marketing for our own company um but you know this is our awesome product and what do you think and the visibility that they would gain throughout let's say a you know a product overview was was significant because they would leave that call thinking like we're so excited to start using this like how do how do we get on board very quickly um you know you mentioned you, you don't just call them up and they say hey yeah we're just going to try out Mariposa. that's actually kind of what happened at golden state warriors really? they were on a platform and they had two weeks sorry and this is crazy but they had uh maybe it wasn't two weeks maybe it was four weeks to get off of that platform that is extremely fast for an organ like that's not even remotely normal uh for a for an organization of that size and we made it happen and we and we went into that meeting you know or those meetings with with conviction that we could make it happen you know with with the trust in the and the relationship that you know they felt we we would pull it off and and we did um you know how did they hear about you, you in the beginning how did they hear about you in the first place i i actually am not sure okay i know i you know yeah i wasn't i wasn't involved in that part of the process yeah. i i honestly think it might have been a conference or, or some type of there was some relationship though it wasn't they didn't just pick up the phone right. and call us and say hey we heard your name no there was there was certainly some you know some lead time to that but um, again you don't really run into the scenario where somebody just says hey yeah we've got four weeks to make this happen can you do it yes or no uh, not at that size the at um talk about the single customer view i know before we got on we yeah. were talking about that and what that means exactly yeah so there's a, you know, there's a huge, to- it's, right, it's a big topic now that, that's certainly the focal point of, of most, you know, individuals within the marketing space is how do we better understand our customer, you know, across all channels in, in one area, right? And some people are buying Tableau and some people are buying Domo, which are more dashboard tools. Some people are buying CDP, some people are buying CRMs, but at the end of the day, they just want to, lo- you know, they want to log in there and say, who is Jeremy? How much is he worth to us? What is he doing? And how do we, you know, increases lifetime value as an example or increases engagement as an example the easier companies can of course or organizations like mine can make that you know on on our for our customers you know the faster they're going to start to understand their customers better they're going to be able to target their customers better they're going to execute their strategies significantly better they're going to understand their personas better and we really want to move into a state where you know an organization can understand or, or sorry can be told who their who their top personas are I'm always hesitant to talk about things like AI and machine learning, but the reality is, is that marketing is, you know, in, in many <laughs> Why ways, are you hesitant? About, because there's do people throw uh, it around as buzzwords? Or? It's been, yeah, it's thrown around far too much. I mean, at the end of the day, a machine learning would suffice, but you're just, you know, the technologies that we use today need to tell us who our best customers are, to tell us when we should be contacting them, to tell us how we should be contacting them. Um, and that's not really that difficult, but no one's really focused on it because kill, uh, um, sorry, connecting all of those data points is actually quite difficult, right? If you have, again, if you have a CRM and an e-commerce platform and a service platform and an acquisition platform and a, you know, a web platform, like bringing all that together as you're growing is quite difficult, you know, and the big companies out there, the Oracles, the, the sales forces, the IBMs, you know, they're, they're, they're buying their way to that. Whereas we want to build our way to that. We want to build the underlying technology and we want to build, of course, the front end or, or the top level of it. Um, so that's very much our focus when you start to think about customer view, because then we can control how much information, you know, our, our customers can see about theirs in a very simple, scalable manner. 
you know, scale is a huge component for, for most companies. Uh, sorry, when I say companies, for most tech companies. You know, I've, I've seen countless organizations who have great platforms, but they can't bring on customers who are above a certain size or, you know, they have to price it in such a way where it just would never make sense. Or, of course, the, the common theme is things start to fail. You know, what I mean, uh, uh, reporting isn't rendering like there's a, you know, an infinite kind of number of issues that you can run into when you're trying to grow and trying to adapt very quickly to that is, is something we've, you know, thankfully succeeded at, um, you know, based on our, our development and our, our tech team. So. That's always really exciting as well. What are the different pieces, Ross? Because like, obviously, it starts off as an email service provider, and for you to really truly get a single customer view, and it sounds like you execute on that, and it's not just a dashboard. I mean, you have the tools internally mm -hmm. that you can Correct. use yeah. to actually execute on those things. Um, what are some of the, I guess, um, pieces within that, within your system that are used? Because yeah. the email piece. What are the dashboard sure. piece? What else? What else is in there? Yeah. So our two main sort of, you know, I don't know if you want to call them channels or kind of the centerpiece of the platform, you know, on, on the is, is marketing and then commerce. So within the marketing arena, you have, you know, email, mobile, so mobile being pushed in, messaging, social being posting, listening and so on. Um, marketing automation, of course, which ties it all together. You then have acquisition tools. So things like, you know, pop up modals, landing pages. Um, you know, surveys and forms and that kind of stuff. Uh, but then on the commerce side, that's where we focus on, again, the single, you know, not necessarily single customer view, but the actual storefront. So that's a, you know, this is again, a new area for us. We, we have storefront solutions, we have order form solutions, we have payment solutions. Um, so we're, we're, again, we're merging that together to create that single customer view on top. And then as we continue to advance, you know, the platform and, and sort of the next stages, you know, we would get into the service area. So that way, you know, if, if Ross is logged in and he's trying to understand the lifetime value of his customers, he can do all that. If he's trying to market to his customers, he can do all that. And again, in the end stage, how do we also service those same customers? Because all of that information is relevant, right? I, I always use the, you know, the example, like if um, I, I'll, I'll choose Lululemon here um, because I happen to shop there way too much. But, um, you know, if somebody, if I had a problem with an order, you know, it didn't get delivered as an example. And I call in, hey, what happened with my order? I want personally, the support rep to see my profile because they're going to say, hey, Ross, over the last five years spent, you know, $5,000. <laughs> a crap load of money. Buy. Yeah, yeah. He Give them a free t-shirt. Who cares? Yeah. Well, not only, yeah, exactly. I mean, the first thing that you would want that person to do is say, this is a, a extremely large customer in terms of our, our overall. Let's, you know, go with it you know, go the extra mile, not he's the exact same as Jeremy and Jeremy maybe just bought one shirt. It's not that you want to, you know, no, I totally get it. Some anything, customers reality is a business. Yeah, yeah. It, it totally is. Yeah. Uh, so it puts it in one place. But that's also, I think, from a founder perspective, a company perspective, a tough decision to make because you have to deploy resources for each one of those things. So how do you Absolutely. make that decision? You, you could take like an A-Weber that they just like, we're yeah, sticking to email. Yeah. I don't want to do anything yeah. else. We just want to do yeah. email. So how did you make that decision? It's hard to branch into all of these things, which is valuable for a higher level customer, you know, like Mercedes or Golden State Warriors. Yeah. And you're like, you can't serve, a, you know, maybe like a mom and pop, you know, candy yeah. store or something because of it. Yeah. I mean, the upside, so there's, so I hear sort of two questions there. I mean, the, the upside is that, you know, with, with the direction we're going in, you can really service a business of every, every size. I don't mean kind of starting up today and I'm at zero, you know, I would definitely wouldn't recommend that. But if you, you know, if you had two successful businesses before that and you use the same technologies, we, when we see this a lot of the time is people will sign up for that day one because they're thinking, you know, I'm going to spend 10 times more today than I need to, but I'm going to save a hundred times more, not having to think about this at any time in the future. Um, you know, the, the other side of the question now is, is of course more important, the decision side of things. So yeah. I tend to be a bit of a Tasmanian devil when it comes to ideas and, and, you know, direction. And, and that's where, you know, again, the team and, and, and certainly actually, you know, certainly our, our CEO helps me to kind of focus that. Um, but I've gone through times where I'm like, Hey, we're going to do all this. And then it's like, okay, that was clearly way too much. Let's, let's pare it down. Let's organize it better. And, and let's, you know, move forward with more of a, a plan, uh, or, or an approach to how we're going to tackle each area. I mean, in the best case scenario, you, you can do it all. But in the worst case scenario, again, you just have to you have to take your time with it. And, and you have to make sure that, you know, I don't know if the question was sort of for, for everyone, but you have to make sure that you're not going to cannibalize, 
you know, the current business that you've had, you have, sorry, that you have. I can certainly say that in some ways over the past years, you know, as we started to look at these other channels, you know, we weren't prepared to bring them on board uh, as much as we are today, as an example. So taking the time and really thinking about that and had I gone back and, and maybe had a clear, you know, sense of what was going to be involved, probably would have done things differently. Yeah. Actually, definitely would have done things differently. So you, ha- you do have to be really careful, right? It's again, the the, the the old term scope creep. I mean, that that hasn't changed at all. I think we just use different terminology now to define it. Um, How do you guys so get so much yeah. done? I mean, part of my yeah. question was sort of like, wow, like most companies can't get this amount of features mm-hmm. into a product, you know? I think we have exceptional people, both in the development, on the product side of things, you know, from a vision standpoint, um, you know, we really have things organized from there. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the people for sure. I mean, it comes down to people. There's no, there's no technology solution or, or, or database environment that you can buy that will, that will be more beneficial than just having great individuals at the helm uh, mm-hmm. from that standpoint. Yeah. Um, and there's a bunch of use cases, like you mentioned, um, Mercedes Benz, Golden State Warriors. I want to talk about ZipBuds for a second because sure. um, how does ZipBuds use the platform? So they're using it in a, in a again, as you mentioned earlier, like a, a more simplistic manner. So, so a little bit of automation, but mostly email. So, so not necessarily, you know, the best use case, but the, you know, the results that they would see would be significantly stronger than if they had a platform that was just for those tools. So what I mean is, you know, they, they went with something that was, pro- you know, most likely more expensive and, and had more functionality that they needed, but they wanted to have, you know, a, a team and a, you know, a relationship with the provider as they, as they grew or as they continue to grow. So, you know, there, there's obviously so many different, you know, types of situations that where customers come in and what they're looking for. And, you know, what we, really do well is we try to focus on, you know, how are we going to make them successful within not only their requirements, but like what we've seen others do, right? So they're coming in and saying, hey, what are you doing with, you know, customers XYZ that are, you know, five or 10 times bigger than we are, um, but clearly growing within their verticals or within their product categories. And we really want to be that, you know, that trusted partner, that Mm. trusted advisor when it comes to that, not just here's your login and password, you know, let us know if there's a problem. I they really mean, value the strategic piece of it. I mean, that this is yeah. actually really interesting because the conversation I've been having lately is is mm-hmm. people just see it as just an entity, whether it's software or whatever it is. But yep. the real exactly. huge value is the strategic piece. So talk mm-hmm. about that. How does it work? Yeah. They're talking to your team and they're giving high-level advice. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we're, we're looking at what they are doing and, and really you're providing recommendations. You know, I would say... You know, my recommendations come a little in a little bit more of a form of direction uh, when I used to do that, you know, because I've seen so much and, and you want, you know, you want your team to come at it from that same perspective as in, you know, you don't have to do these five things. But if you do them, this this is the impact they're going to make, whether that be revenue, you know, engagement, um, you know, or opportunity wise, you know, and so as we continue to progress and get better at that ourselves, right? We want to, again, we want to put forth these ideas with the ramifications of what they're going to mean so that it's, Hey, somebody's getting promoted at an organization because of what they accomplished with Maripost or, you know, revenue tripled. And, and as such, of course, your, your business as well. So you're bringing in new individuals to help grow the company even further. Um, you know, there, there's just, there's a lot more you can do than just being, as you said, another software vendor, um, mm. you know, and, and, I think a lot of companies, you know, tech companies now are doing a good job at sort of, you know, making the process to sign up and and start, you know, completing the actions or the activities you're doing. But they very much moved away from that sort of consultative, you know, uh, advisory arena. Right? It's easier to set up a self-service company today than it is to set up, you know, more of an enterprise company, as an example. Mm -hmm. The it sounds like you're getting more and more e-commerce companies using Maripost. Yeah, that's definitely our largest our largest market uh, or vertical. That is, yeah. So, are they using it similar or different from ZipBuds? You finding? Uh, sim- similar, but probably depending on again where they are in the in the life cycle. Like, you know, you would want them. You, the first thing you want people to do is start tying revenue back, right? So, step one is bring all your customers in, bring their purchases in, and you know, step two is okay, you know, organizing them based on on audiences and segments and so on. 
and then how are you going to target you know those people to of course increase revenue but the you know the goal of course is to say hey we you know we targeted you know 500,000 customers with this messaging and we generated you know who knows 5 million dollars worth of revenue right that's that's the goal because as soon as you can you know simplify the method of tying you know those two numbers together you know now you can really start to look at it and say every decision we make is going to impact the revenue in a positive way you know hopefully not negative but i've i've seen everything at this right point. Yeah. Who's ideal, Ross, uh, ideal e-commerce company to be on your platform? Uh, really anyone who, who does, you know, I mean, anyone, as I said, of any size. But, you know, the, the sweet spot is really kind of that, you know, 20 to 50 million in revenue, you know, whether the, whether it's, you know, about email volume, kind of they're sending, you know, five to 10 email or million emails, you know, a month or, or 120 million emails a year. You know, maybe they've got, you know, a half a million or a million customers um, it really comes into that range. So, you know, physical products, of course, are our core for, for us in terms of, um, you know, re really anybody actually that falls within that group. I mean, um, the e-commerce space is so, so large. So it's, you know, again, it's anyone who fits into kind of those metrics. Do you guys, I know we, we mentioned Salesforce and some of those companies, um, probably have an acquisition strategy. What, what about Merrill Post as far as you acquiring companies? Yeah, so so I don't follow that philosophy no. as much. Mm. I mean, what you're sorry as much uh, at all. Um, <laughs> you know, I think you know. Of course, there there can be situations, or I've seen situations, of course, where you, people are you know you're acquiring a company for the for the talent for the individuals who work in the company. Right. You're you're you know acquiring co uh, a company for the technology. You're acquiring a company for the customers. But in all honesty, I mean. You can always you can always find talent. You know, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it, it, it's certainly not hard to the point where you have to buy a company for it. You can always acquire customers. Obviously, you know, having a successful marketing and sales strategy is going to complete that. Um, and the technology side of things, you know, I only see that as much now when you're thinking of again those large organizations where, you know, they they somehow have the resources to combine everything together, and, and it, they're creating again kind of a, a a valuation or an equity increase at, at such a large scale that it's worth it to buy a company for, you know, use MuleSoft. I think they were doing, I could be wrong here, but, you know, 600 million in revenue or something like that and sold for 6.5 billion. Um, actually, I'm probably wrong. Let me have a look here. Uh, sorry, 300 million in revenue. So 20 times their revenue, uh, you know, 2017 revenue, wow. but purchased for 6.5 billion. And that will, will amplify Salesforce's position in terms of that, you know, in terms of that environment. But I don't know a lot of people who have six point five billion dollars. So, you know, you, you kind of run into a unique situation where you know valuation versus reality is very dif difficult when you're in you know let's say the Maripost stage or or the stage of you know ninety nine percent of of technology companies. Yeah. Um, so I don't really. The short answer to all that is I don't really believe in that as a philosophy. I believe that you know that money would be better spent you know focusing on your own technologies, your own customer acquisition strategies, and and building from there. Yeah. Um, and again, we're, we're at a time where, you know, we talked about this earlier, money is really cheap right now. So, and, and easily accessible. So it makes it even harder, you know, to acquire companies because their valuations are as high as they've, they've ever been. So, you know, for a, for a $20 million company, you're, you're not going to, you know, we, we were looking at somebody a couple of weeks ago, they want 200 million. I mean, the, you know, 10 times uh, revenue. You know, of course, uh, you know, they're, they're burning, you know, burning capital from that perspective and somebody probably will buy them. But like that's I don't know. Again, I don't know a lot of people with 200 million dollars just sitting around to to acquire a 20, a 20 million dollar property. Yeah. So Mirapost cares. Where does that fit into the picture? When did you start? So, it? Yeah. So that that has not gotten as much, I guess you could say, time um, as I wish it had. There's. You know, so so where it started was, you know, when I started to think about the long term, you know, plan at Maripost. So again, more of the, you know, again, building of the organization. What is, what do I want to, you know, the the legacy to work look like in a way? You know, I, I, my goal is not to sell off to another organization. In the examples we were just talking about a minute ago, you know, I, I want to leave something behind. Otherwise, what, why bother? You know, what I mean, I, I've seen massive organizations get just buried into. Again, the Salesforce is IBM. I mean, most people don't even remember them anymore, and they were, you know, sold off or purchased just a couple of years ago. Um, and that's great, you know, for for people who who were exiting in those scenarios. But I would rather finish, you know, kind of our path. And so back to Maripost Cares, 
you know, that is sort of the the legacy that we want to leave behind, right? And and focusing, as you said, on on environment and, and conservation and, and um, you know, endangered species at the moment. And, and, you know, who knows where that will go. But, you know, I'm very passionate about both those areas. Of course, if we, we you know, don't take care of our planet, we're not really going to have anywhere to live. So it doesn't matter if it's Mariposa or any company. Um, you know, and we, we managed to, uh, you know, to kill off our, our endangered species or, you know, at a, at a near weekly rate these days. Right. Um, I'm not laughing because that's funny. I'm, I'm actually laughing because it's sad. Yeah. Um, and I would rather spend, you know, our, our time and our excess energy above that, uh, above, sorry, working at Mariposa, you know, towards those those aspects. Um, What's some, so it, what are some things of, that you guys have done or seen with Mariposa Cares for the indigenous Yeah, so the main... The main focus for, for now has been, uh, ironically, sea turtle conservancy. So, you know, whether we are, you know, sponsoring individuals who, who go to certain areas with, throughout the world, you know, Tortuga is a good example, where there's millions of sea turtles that hatch there every year and they're making their way to the water and they, we, they send people there to protect them. Hmm. That's, a, that's a main focus. There's a couple of, um, you know, Africa-based organizations that are, are protecting elephants, uh, you know, lions, tigers, and so on. Um, that we we haven't yet supported, but we want to, uh, you know, just in terms of the, the conservation efforts and, and effectively the capital that's required to just do so from a day, you know, a, literally a daily basis. Um, so we, as I said, we haven't done enough. We want to do more. But, you know, I, my feeling is that what, you have to get to a certain point before you can say, okay, we're now going to dedicate, you know, whether it's 10% of my time or, or 1% of everyone's time towards those. And you know, we're, we're sort of cautiously moving in the direction where, you know, we can start to then launch real programs where our employees can get involved. They can, of course, sponsor, or recommend, or they can vote on organizations that they would want to support. And then, you know, for the executive team, we can really get behind those and say, like, hey, our, our, our team, we've got 10, 15, 20 people here who are really excited about this. Like, let's all do something together with it. Um, so that that's really kind of, you know, I guess you could say the, the current state and then the future plans for it. Um, and then, I mean, the other thing that you mentioned is, is you know, on, on the technology side, and this isn't sort of a piece about Maripost, but, you know, the, the nonprofit space is probably the, the most poorly served, uh, you know, vertical within the tech space because, you know, most people don't wake up thinking, you know, I want to service organizations that aren't generating a profit. Right? It's, kind of, right. it's kind of an oxymoron in a way. So for us, you know, we want to build you know, or not bill, but like have our platform, you know, be usable for nonprofits so that they can, you know, have something that's easy to use, have something that's, you know, innovative, have something that's, you know, helping them to solicit, whether it be donations or, or sponsors or, or what have you, in a way that doesn't become, you know, a massive cost center for their organization. Um, and it's not that, you know, we, we don't want them to, to have to, you know, have a solution that they pay for. It's just, we want to make sure it's super efficient for them. So that again, similar to the revenue side, the more successful they are at soliciting donations, the more successful they are at completing or, or, or finalizing the programs that they're, you know, that they're running. And to me, that's the most important bit. Same as, again, selling products at the end of the day. Totally. Yeah. Ross, first of all, thank you. This is, yeah. I, I love hearing your take on all these, these uh, different aspects of business. And I have two last questions since it's inspired an insider. I always ask is one, What's been a low moment, uh, a tough time that you had to push through? And on the flip side, what's been a really proud high moment for you? Um, because in this journey, oftentimes we see all, from the outside, the we we'll see the good stuff, but yeah. we don't see the challenges and some of the low points. Yeah. What's been, what's been um, a tougher time that you had to push through? Yeah, I think, you know... That's a tough one. I mean, it's not a tough one that it doesn't exist. That's a tough one in that I'd say when you run into conflicts with individuals, you know, whether it be on your team or in some form in the organization where there's a philosophical difference of opinion, it's no different than having a partner where you disagree, you know, on a specific direction. Um, that was pro that is probably one of the hardest aspects um, because there's no you know, if, if you're if you're just on the opposite ends of one another, there's no, mid, you know, there's not really a middle ground, right? When you when you reach a certain level, right? When you're in the early stages, I think, you know, people start up organizations and they're, you know, they bring on a, a, a partner and they're thinking, yeah, it's all going to be, you know, rainbows and unicorns forever, you know, champagne for all kind of thing. The reality is, you know, once you get, once, you know, once more money's involved, you know, you get yeah. to 5 million, 10 million and so on. And people change, right? They change their direction or, or maybe you never were, were, were philosophically aligned and it's just coming out now. 
you don't have a lot of control over that. So I'd say one of, you know, one of the low moments or combination of low moments for me was, was certainly, you know, being involved in, in a situation like that and having to make, you know, a tough decision on, okay, well, how do we unwind whatever we did or how do we change the direction of what we're doing? Because we're not going to get onto the same page and let's, let's stop trying, you know what I mean? Because we're just not going to get there. Uh, that's tough because again, there's, there's a lot of things involved. You've got, you know, your, your team may be involved. You've got, there's finances that may be involved. There's, there's risk of course involved. Um, there's, there's so many different moving parts there. And I would say that was, you know, is probably those, those, that scenario for me and those types of scenarios are probably the most complicated of, of, you know, an entrepreneur, founder, executive's life because it's intertwined with your life as well. Like it's, it's, it's part of your, you know, your fiber and your fabric and, um, How getting you through those can be, can be very, yeah, you, you, well, sometimes you can't, or sometimes it's easier said than done, right? Uh, like many things. So, yeah, so that, that I'd say it comes along with those, those kind of partnerships or those, those high level relationships that sometimes you're just not aligned with. That was probably, Would I really, the back? sound is bad, but uh, yeah, that is the toughest part. You know, it's, it's the people, especially when it's, you know, with you, it's mm-hmm. a very high value with the team building culture. So something mm-hmm. involving, you know, something that doesn't go smoothly with the people part is difficult. Would you go back and do anything differently or you just, it just is what it is type of thing? Like if you were to go back to that same situation. I think it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think it is what it is. It's hard to say, you know, again, if, if I, if I knew what I knew now, I probably would have done things differently. Yeah. I mean, I would have done things differently. It's not that I wouldn't have done it. I would have just maybe positioned things in a different way. Um, but it, you know, it's again, it's hard because you never know what aspects, whether they be, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary, may have come from that decision at the time, right? And it's, I think a lot of people would be quick to discount that and say, oh, like it just didn't work out. I wish I would have, I, I regret it, or I wish I would have done it differently. When in reality, they're not thinking of all these other things yeah. that pin on top of them. Well, if you didn't do that, would this have happened? Maybe it yeah. would. Maybe it wouldn't. Some but good came out of I mean. it. Yeah, some good did, or hopefully it did. Um, yeah. You know, and that's all you can really hold on to is the positive and then again think of the forward movement from there. Yeah. Yeah. What about on the flip side, um especially proud moments? Yeah, I mean everything related to customers is certainly a problem. When I say everything related to, I mean, you know, whether that be the the selling of the customer, the onboarding of the customer, the support of the customer, uh, has always been super exciting. I mean, of course you, you, you brought up a good example early on. You know, meeting my my chief technology officer. I mean, that that's certainly, you know, among, you know, it's not the t- not that that moment was was it, but that relationship and what that sort of become and and you know who you know who we are to it's each other. Key. That's certainly. And they moved over yeah. from India to Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not that not that. The, of course, the hundred percent the relate. You know, that's it's key, but you know, I think for both of us, we would blindly follow the other end of the night, so to speak, you know, um, and that's super rare these days. I mean, you know, a lot of it's, I think that that's an important quality to have, but it's, it's really hard to get to that point. I mean, you don't see, you know, I, I would have a hard time saying I do that to other people. I think, you know, people would have a hard time saying that to me. So it's just, it's just a difficult thing for somebody to believe in. Um, but we, because we had that so early on, you know, and I've always had his best interest in heart and he's always had mine that it just kind of, you know, got to that. So it's a very proud moment, you know, both then and now that two people were willing to like totally trust one another and there was no, you know, confusion or ambiguity or, you know, ulterior motives or, you know, strategies that one person was trying to play against the other it was always just a very honest, you know, approach, despite saying very few words to each other as an example. You mentioned, Not that we don't talk or anything, but... Yeah, you mentioned customers as a proud moment. Um what's been a favorite in your mind customer success story? I know you guys have a bunch of, you know, if someone goes to Meripost.com, you know, customer page, you have a number of, you know, really cool Mm -hmm. stories there. Which one sticks out to you? One that's really exciting to me is, um, is a company called Biotrust. Have you heard of them before? Yes. Yeah. So, so they're really exciting to me. They're a nutritional company, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Nutritional yeah. company. So there, you know, I could of course pick some of the larger ones, the Rolling Stones, New York Post, Mercedes and so on, um, you know, that everyone w- would know about. But the they're exciting because they generate so much of their revenue through our platform. 
um, and the way that they generate it. So as in their content is more is more story based as an example. So it's more like they're, they're, they're speaking to their customers as an example, as opposed to, you know, selling their customers as an example. I get all their you emails, know, Ross. Yeah, so email, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So th- that's, you know, I've always found that super exciting because you built a business off of, you know, and, and there's a lot of these that, you know, we have a couple customers who generate a hundred percent of their revenue through, through email and, and marketing automation. Um, so it's exciting to me because of that, right? Because they, they, they're, they're so, you know, deep into an industry that I'm so passionate about and that has, has given me so much, it's given our, our team and, and company so much, um, that they, that they believe, you know, philosophically that, you know, this is, and it is the top channel, regardless of what anybody wants to say, but that they believe that, you know, again, without, you know, kind of prejudice or without any kind of, you know, differing views. And so I'm proud of that because we were, you know, we we and, and I were a part of that transition from, you know, probably a 15, 20 million dollar company to, you know, 150 million dollar company. And, you know, being there and working through that process with, you know, with entrepreneurial individuals like the, the two founders there, you know, was was super exciting because the things that they were doing or, or the way that, you know, the way they were approaching it with, with passion and, and, and vigor is the same way I would do it. Right. So I could never fault them. Like they would call me like they were, you know, they're, you know, in a panic, this isn't, something's not working or, or we ran into an issue or, 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 or something, you know, we, we sent to the wrong customer group. Um, you know, they're coming at it with, with, you know, with such, you know, excitement again, or not excitement, it's not the word I would use, but you know, such vigor that, I was like, yeah, if I was in your shoes, this is what I would be doing as well. And so that's pretty fun, you know, really fun because you you feel a part of that and you know the feeling because you're like, I've been there before with another vendor. Like Ross has been there with Rackspace or with Google or with Akamai or with some of the many, you know, platforms I do. But I wasn't talking to, you know, the CEO of those companies who built the company from scratch. And, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, you've got to submit a ticket and we'll have somebody call you. And, you know, and, and so every every company is different. But those were, those ones were really exciting. Yeah, the ones that you, me. some of them you were working one on one with the, with the actual yeah. founder, and you yeah. saw them really build their company through that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah from from scratch. Yeah. Love I mean, it. the other ones, like again, the big companies, the Mercedes, like they're established. Like obviously, we're making an impact yeah. with them. But the individuals that we're working with there, they're not directly, like personally impacted by. It. Of course, they're going to get you know hopefully promotions and raises and so on and so forth, but you know, they're not going to, they're not going to be impacting yeah. the same way of somebody getting, going from 20 to 150. Yeah. It's miles. not their baby, so to speak. Like these, exactly. This, Correct. Is, yeah. this is their baby. Like this, we've yeah. seen this, we bird this, this thing. This has it, to work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah totally. Yeah, it has to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ross, thank you. I appreciate your time. I know right now you're in Sweden um, at the yeah. time we're, we're <laughs> talking about this. So thank you for taking time out of your, your busy schedule and everyone should check out MeralPost.com. It's M-A-R-O-P-O-S-T.com. And where else should we point people towards online, Ross? Yeah, I mean, our site is definitely the best place to find out anything about Merrill Post. Um, I obviously am on Twitter and Instagram and, and Facebook, um, you know, cataloging some of my, my life, whether day to day or travel. Um, you know, so I'm, I, that's a, an area where I'm always excited by because I think they're, you know, again, entrepreneurs aren't, are, are some of them are really out there, but some of them, you know, most of them aren't. Um, and it's really great for, you know, I think, you know, uh, the, the overall communities to, to see what's happening with these people on a, you know, whether it be day, daily or weekly, but what are they doing? Where are they going? You know, wh- where are they traveling to? What conferences are they going to? That stuff's all really exciting to, to many people, right? Who want to be inspired to, you know, to do the same and see what that can look like for them. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out MerrillPost.com. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.